Chapter 22 Arthur Traveling in the back of a wagon over bumpy roads wasn't exactly comfortable. After the first moments of adrenaline wore off, Arthur realized it was rather boring too. To make matters worse, the driver had a penchant for singing, but not the voice for it, and his off-key, overly loud, sometimes bawdy tunes made for a very long day with very little chance to sleep. At least Arthur had Guinevere next to him, even if they didn't speak for fear of being discovered. It gave him some comfort to feel her warm breath on his face, knowing he wasn't alone. He could imagine tr- he couldn't imagine trying to do any of this without her, and he was so grateful she'd agreed to come along. This wasn't her fight, after all, but she was a good friend. A good friend. His hands reached involuntarily to his lips. No, he couldn't think of that anymore. She'd only been trying to save him from being recognized by his knights, and went no further than that. He reminded himself of Archimedes' words, You don't have time for romance. But even still, his fingers lingered a moment longer on his lips, remembering. Merlin had given him a lecture on love, and at the time, he hadn't understood it one bit. But now, he thought maybe he did, if only a little. Eventually, the wagon came to a stop. Arthur and Gwyn held their breaths as the driver stepped down from his seat. Arthur peeked out from under the tarp, watching him head into a small farmhouse at the edge of a great forest. We're here, he whispered. That's the forest savage. I'd recognize it anywhere. Quick, Guinevere cried. Let's slip out before he gets back. Arthur didn't need a second invitation. They climbed out from beneath the tarp and jumped off the wagon. Arthur almost fell at it as his feet hit the ground hard. His legs weakened from all that time cramped up without being used. He grabbed onto the side of the wagon for support, then shook out each leg, waking it up in turn. Beside him, Guinevere did the same. We made it, he said. I can't believe we made it. Well, not quite yet, she hedged, looking out at the forest beyond them, worrying her lower lip with her teeth. We still have to get through that. Oh, right. In his excitement, Arthur had forgotten how dangerous the forest sauvage could be. Filled with creatures and other nasty things that went bump in the night. <clears throat> he didn't have any weapons on him, either, since he, he'd had to leave Excalibur behind. Something he was still a little bitter about. But there was no other way to Sir Edgar's castle. So through the force it went. it was. Come on, he said. We want to get through before dark. As they stepped under the trees, the world seemed to darken, the vast canopy of leaves above them all but blocking out the sun. It also felt colder here without the warm rays of sunshine kissing their skin. Arthur suppressed a shiver as they walked. I never liked this place, he remarked. It always scared me. I don't know. Guinevere replied with a shrug. I grew up here, so it's kind of like coming home. That's right, Arthur exclaimed, turning to her. I forgot you said you lived here once. What made you move again? Guinevere gave an awkward shrug. Ask my mother. It was her idea. Arthur nodded. It must be nice to have a mother, he remarked. I never did. Even Sir Edgar, my foster father had already lost his wife before I came to live at his castle. But I've always imagined having a mother having a mother would be really nice. What happened to your parents? Guinevere asked, suddenly sounding very curious. Were they killed? She mouthed the word killed a little awkwardly, as if hesitant to use it. I don't actually know, Arthur admitted. Sir Edgar never told me. I don't know if he knows, to be honest. 
He found me on the castle steps, only a few days old, screaming blue, blue murder. He took me in and allowed me to live in the castle with him and Kay. But never as a true son, he added, his voice revealing his bitterness. More as a servant, he didn't have to pay. His mind flashed back to his foster father's face in the castle hall as Kay had come up to challenge him the day before. The man who had raised him, now plotting his demise. Arthur had always wanted to impress Sir Edgar, gain his approval, and it hurt more than, than he wanted to admit to know the feeling was not mutual. I'm sorry, Quinn replied. That must have been rough. Arthur shrugged, not wanting to be pitied. We can't choose our birth story, but we can choose how to live the rest of our lives. Guinevere nodded, not replying. Arthur turned to look at her. Your mother won't be worried about you, will she? He asked. When she realizes you've gone? He hated the idea of worrying this poor, unknown woman. Guinevere shrugged. I don't know if worried would be the word I'd use. Arthur could tell he was making her uncomfortable and decided to drop the subject. Still, he couldn't help a small stirring of pity for Gwen, who obviously had a complicated relationship with her mother. Arthur had always assumed mothers were good and kind and loving. But maybe as with foster fathers, this was not always the case for everyone. He was about to try to change the subject when they heard a rustling noise in the bushes. Arthur froze in his tracks, grabbing Guinevere by the arm. She turned to look, her eyes widening as they fell upon what Arthur was already staring at across the path. A pair of unblinking yellow eyes shining out from the darkness. Don't make any sudden moves, Arthur whispered. Maybe it'll go away. The eyes blinked twice. Then, to Arthur's horror, they began to emerge from the bushes. As they came into the light, he realized they belonged to a long, lanky gray wolf. A very hungry-looking long, lanky gray wolf. The wolf lifted its head and howled. A mournful, lonely sound that made Arthur's skin crawl. This was not good. This was not good at all. And the wolf looked right at them. Quinn, run, he cried. Now! They burst into action, dashing down the trail as fast as their legs could carry them. For a moment, Arthur dared hope that maybe the wolf would be caught off guard and they could get far enough away before it began pursuit. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And soon, they could hear the creature behind them, gaining ground. The wolf was fast, so fast. And it became very clear to Arthur that outrunning it was not an option. What do we do? Guinevere cried. She wasn't as fast as Arthur because of her long dress and slippers, and she was already falling behind. I don't know, Arthur replied his heart beating fast. He looked around the forest, trying to find a big stick or rock, but, some, but saw nothing large enough to scare away a grown wolf. Maybe we should try climb it. We should try to climb a... Guinevere started, then screamed as her foot caught under a root. Arthur watched in dismay as she careered forwards, slamming fast fir face first into the dirt. Quinn! he shouted, retracing his steps to get back to her. She looked up at him with tears glistening in her brown eyes. I'm stuck, she confessed, tugging on her foot. It was firmly lodged in the root. Arthur got on his hands and knees, trying to pull it out, but he couldn't. There was another howl. The wolf was getting closer. They were running out of time. Leave me, Guinevere told him. Get to Merlin's tower. Not a chance, he said, shaking his head. I won't leave you. Then he'll kill us both. Maybe, he drew in a breath. Maybe not. Scrambling to his feet, he looked down at Quinn. Lie still. I'm going to lead him away from you. Guinevere's eyes bulged. No, she cried. You can't. 
He'll kill you. Everyone wants to kill me these days, Arthur reminded her wryly. I'm getting you I'm getting kind of used to it. Arthur, trust me, all right? I know what I'm doing. In truth, he had no idea what he was doing. But that didn't sound as comforting. Instead, he grabbed the largest stick he could find and waved it in the air. Over here, you big bad wolf, he cried out. Then he dropped the stick and started running in the opposite direction. For a moment, he worried the wolf wouldn't take the bait. But soon his ears caught more crashing sounds behind him as the wolf dived through the bushes in pursuit. He let out a breath of relief and pushed onwards, his mind racing for a plan. He couldn't outrun the wolf, that was for sure. His legs were already tiring, and he was almost completely out of breath. And he couldn't dodge the wolf like he had with Kay. It was much nimbler a creature than his foster brother in armor. He looked for trees to climb, but saw nothing with branches low enough to reach. He couldn't hide in a cave either. The wolf would just scent him easily and follow. So what to do? The forest was getting thicker and darker the further he ran, and he started to worry that even if he managed to lose the wolf, he'd get lost himself forever. Don't panic, he scolded himself. Just think. What would Merlin say in a case like this? Probably something grand like, use your wish wisdom, not your might. Which was all well and good until you tried to actually do that and still run at the same time. Knowledge. Wisdom. What do I know about wolves? He asked himself. After all, he'd grown up in the Four Sauvage and had been schooled constantly on their danger. What had Sir Edgar taught him back when he was little, in case he ever came face to face with such a creature. They're as afraid of you as you are of them. And suddenly, he realized exactly what he had to do. He had to face down the wolf, man the beast. He had to stop running. This was, as you can imagine, easier said than done, because he had no idea, in reality, if Sir Edgar had been right. It was one thing to boast about facing down a wolf and quite another to actually do so, all alone in the woods. But he didn't have a choice, did he? It took all his willpower to slam his heels into the ground, to turn around, to draw in a breath, make his shoulders square, lift his chin, raise his hands manically in the air, try to look two times his size, and then... He let out a roar as loud as he could. The wolf skidded to a stop. It stared up at him for a moment, its eyes bulging from its head. Arthur roared again, taking a menacing step towards the creature. He knew the wolf could kill him at any moment, end this ruse. But first, the wolf had to realize that too. And it didn't seem to get to it or get get it. Arthur roared a third time, this time charging at the wolf. The creature let out a scared whimper and started running in the other direction. Arthur chased it for a moment, feeling a thrill of excitement roll through him as he went, arms still raised, voice still roaring, until the wolf had disappeared completely and he was alone once again. He dropped his arms and sucked in a huge mouthfuls of air. He'd done it. He'd actually done it. Arthur! He looked up to see Guinevere limping towards him. She had a huge smile on her face. You did it, she cried. You defeated the wolf! Arthur felt his cheeks heat. His first instinct was to brush off her words, to protest and insist it wasn't that big of a thing. But it was. He suddenly realized he, Arthur, had faced down an actual wolf and won. He should be proud. And he was. Are you all right? He asked Guinevere, looking down at her ankle. I'm fine, she said. It's just a little bruised. Her eyes leveled on him. 
They look soft somehow in the dim forest light. Thank you, she said simply. You saved my life. You saved mine first, he reminded her with a sheepish grin. I guess now we're even. Perhaps so, she agreed with a smile. Now, let's get to Merlin's Tower. Chapter 23, Guinevere. The rest of the trip proved much less eventful. Arthur, fortunately, still remembered the way to his foster father's keep. Soon he was leading Guinevere out of the dark forest into a golden afternoon with a magnificent castle in full view. Even better was the fact that Sir Edgar and his son were back in London. Gwen and Arthur were able to walk right into the place and head straight to the tall, crumbling tower where Merlin had stayed once upon a time. As they climbed the old, descript stairs to the very top, Guinevere began to feel a growing nervousness in the pit of her stomach. They'd escaped the castle, a wolf, and a dark wood. But now they, they were entering the inner lair of the evil wizard who'd murdered her parents. What vile monstrosity would they find inside? Turned out, a lot of junk. Did someone rob the place? She couldn't help blurting as they walked into the room. Toppled piles of books and random papers made the place look as though it had been ransacked or torn apart by a storm. She noted a huge hole in the roof and a bucket placed underneath now filled with rainwater. The tower had clear seen better days. Or the tower had clearly seen better days. Arthur looked around the dish, dish disheveled room. To her surprise, his lips curled in amusement. Let's just say housekeeping isn't one of Merlin's specialties, he joked. And he left rather in a hurry, he pointed to the hole in the ceiling, as if indicating this was how the wizard had made his exit. Did Mer Merlin make you clean for him too, like Sir Edgar did? Guinevere asked curiously, remembering what Arthur had said about his foster father. Merlin usually leaves the cleaning to magic, Arthur replied. Which is interesting, if not always effective. You should have seen the one time he tried to use magic to help me with the cas castle dishes. He laughed, as if remembering the moment fondly. Guinevere watched, curious despite herself, as Arthur walked over to a round blue ball painted with strange brown markings and set on a stand. He spun it with his hand and it twirled around and around. The markings blurred as it went. It was still disconcerting to Quinn to hear Arthur talk about Merlin. His voice took an affectionate tone when he spoke of his teacher, as if he loved him a lot. It was clear he was some kind of father figure to him, as men had been a mother to her. Did he have any inkling of the darkness lurking inside this madman who had taken him under his wing? She tried to imagine how she'd feel if tables were turned, if Mim were the evil one and Quinn had been tricked by her treachery. The idea made her feel quite uncomfortable. How did you meet Merlin anyway? She asked, mostly to change the subject. Oh, it was kind of an accident, Arthur said looking bashful all of a sudden. I was trying to get Kay's arrow, which had gone into the woods. I accidentally fell through his ceiling just as he was having tea, and he invited me to stay. He grinned at the memory. He told me he had been expecting someone, but he didn't know who until I dropped in, literally. So he didn't seek you out? Guinevere asked, surprised. You found him? I guess so, Arthur shrugged. He told me he wanted to be my teacher, and I was thrilled to have him. No one ever really paid me any attention before then. As I said before, I was not mu much more than a bother to my foster father and brother, and I was always breaking dishes in the kitchen, so the cook wasn't fond of me either. 
But Merlin, he treated me like a real person, like someone with value. He stared down at the floor. Everything I am now, the person I've become, it's all because of him. Guinevere nodded, not sure what to say. The Merlin described by Arthur sounded nothing like the man she'd been told to fear all her life. He sounded almost kind, decent, like Arthur himself. How could a man like that murder her parents in cold blood? It didn't make any sense. She thought back to how she'd asked Mim why he'd murdered her parents. All she'd said was that he was evil. But that wasn't a real reason, was it? There had to be something else, something Mim didn't want her to know. But what could it be? So now what? She asked, looking around the room. Are you going to look for some writing of Merlin's? Going to prove his plan? No, Arthur replied with a grin. I'm going to try to bring him back. What? Guinevere cried before she could stop herself. This was not part of the plan. But Arthur was already shuffling through papers on a nearby table. There's got to be a spell, he murmured. He used a spell to send himself to Bermuda. There there has to be another spell to return him home. He turned to a towering bookcase full of books. We just have to find it. Guinevere's heart pounded, seemingly louder and faster than when confronted by the wolf in the forest. It was one thing to search an evil wizard's lair. It was quite another to conjure up the actual evil wizard. But she couldn't exactly say that to Arthur. That might be easier said than done, she reminded him instead, pulling out a book at random. It was titled, The Tome of Terrible Turnips, which didn't seem particularly applicable to their current situation. There's so many books in here. How will you ever be able to find the right one? I'm not sure, Arthur confessed, especially since I can't exactly read. You can't? Guinevere stared at him, astonished, astounded. She couldn't imagine life without books. It would be like life without, well, life. I mean, I know my ABCs, thanks to Archimedes, Arthur amended, looking a little embarrassed. But we didn't have a chance to get much further than that. Let's just say reading wasn't a big priority in the kitchens of Sir Edgar's castle. In fact, I'm not sure even Kay can read. And he's a noble knight. Quinevere considered that this was probably true, judging from what she'd seen of the oafish lad in question. And if Arthur was never meant to be more than a squire, there would have to there would have been more... Pr- Practical reason to educate him, if it hadn't been for Merlin. She shook her head. Well then, I don't know how this is going to work, she said. I can read, but I'm only one person. It would take ages for me to get through all these books to find the correct spell. Even if I did know what I was looking for, which of course I don't. She knew she was talking too fast, making too many excuses and it hurt to see Arthur's face crumble at each one. But what other choice did she have? Undo her mother's spell? Free an evil wizard from captivity and set him loose on the world? Because that was essentially what they were talking about here. Arthur sighed deeply, walking across the room to the window and picking up a book on its sill. I suppose it's too much to ask for them to read themselves. Suddenly, to Guinevere's shock, the book seemed to leap from his hands. She watched, amazed as it hovered in the air, then popped itself open to its front pit first page. A moment later, a low-pitched voice rose to her ears. It's doing it, Arthur cried excitedly, pointing to the book. It's actually reading itself. Sure enough, the book was, indeed, reciting the words on its page. When it had finished, it turned itself to the next page and kept going. That's it, Arthur exclaimed. I completely forgot. All of Merlin's possessions are magical. He used to have this teapot that filled cups of tea on its own. And these books all packed themselves when we left his cottage for the tower. 
Of course they'd be able to read themselves too. That just makes sense if you think about it. Guinevere watched the book, her heart pounding. Magic. This whole place was bursting with magic. And they had no idea what they were dealing with. What was she thinking of Green to come here? She should leave now before... I have an idea, Arthur blurted out. What if we commanded the books to find the spell we're looking for? Guinevere paled. Do you think they'd listen? She asked. They listen when I mention reading themselves, he reminded her. It's worth a try, right? Guinevere found she couldn't argue with that. The look on his face held too much hope, mixed with desperation. I suppose it can't hurt, she agreed reluctantly. Arthur nodded, looking excited. He turned to the shelf of books. Look, um, well, I don't know if you've noticed, books, but Merlin is missing. We need to find him. Do you happen to have a spell or something to, to help us do that? He paused, looking at the shelf expectantly, but nothing happened. The books remained still and unread. Only the first book, which had settled onto a small table by the window, was still reciting its text. So much for that, Arthur muttered, sounding discouraged. He sank down in a chair by the cold, ashy hearth and put his hand on his he head in his hands. I should have known it couldn't be that easy. He sighed deeply and rubbed his face. What am I supposed to do? Why did I even come here? Guinevere squeezed her eyes shut. She let out a long breath, then opened them again. I think you need some magic words, she said slowly. I mean, at least to get them started. Arthur's head jerked up. Of course, he said, his voice filled with excitement again. Merlin always had magic words for each spell. Good idea, Quinn. Quinn gave him a wan smile, her insides churning. What are you doing, she scolded herself. You're going to ruin everything. After all, Mim had trapped Merlin in the future to help keep the kingdom safe, and now Guinevere was helping to bring him back. We just need to figure out what they are. Arthur looked down at the book that was still reading itself. A moment later, his eyes lit up and he beckoned to Gwyn. She stepped towards him, her knees wobbly and her hands shaky. Arthur pointed to the page where, sure enough, a string of strange words had been illuminated in glowing golden letters. What do they say? He asked, looking up at her, his blue eyes shining with hope. She swallowed hard. Lie, she told herself. Just make something up. But instead, the real words rose to her lips. Higginus? Higginus? She whispered. The room burst into life. Books started flying from the shelves so quickly. Quinn was forced to duck so as not to be struck on the head. As she and Arthur watched, each book began flipping madly through its pages. Faster and faster, the words blurring into one another as they read. It's working, Arthur cried excitedly. It's actually working. Instantly, he leapt up and threw his arms around Quinevere, looking her into an exuberant embrace. Quinn, you're like a real wizard, he gushed happily. I'm not a wizard, Quinn protested before she could stop herself. She struggled out of the hug putting her hands out in front of her as if it, as if to ward off the words. Her cheeks began to burn. Arthur looked at her, completely confused. I, I was just joking, he stammered. Sorry. Guinevere closed her eyes, drawn in a long breath. Then she opened them again. No, I'm sorry, she said. It's just, well, magic scares me, if you must know. I understand, Arthur said, his voice softening. I felt that way once, too. But Merlin showed me that magic can be used for good. It can help people. It can make things better. Guinevere nodded stiffly, not trusting herself to speak. Her head felt as if it were swimming with confusion. She wanted to run from the room and never look back. But at the same time, 
She couldn't bear to leave Arthur's side. The books began to move faster, words on each page lighting up one, an- one after another after another as they told their stories to the tower room. Their voices rose in a cacophony of sound until Guinevere just wanted to put her hands over her ears to block them all out. At last, she watched as a heavy golden tome, bigger than the rest, slipped down from the very top of the bookshelf, where it had been hidden behind a small book with a crimson cover. It flew across the room, landing on the table with a loud thump and then opening itself to a gold-leafed page. Guinevere and Arthur ran over to it and scanned the text. What does it say? Arthur asked. It's written in Latin, Guinevere told him, so I can't be quite sure, but I believe it says, How to find someone through time. That must be it! Arthur exclaimed. Should we? He was interrupted by the sound of a slamming door down below. What was that? Guinevere whispered, worried. Arthur ran to the tower door and put his ear to the wood. Oh no, he exclaimed. I think Sir Edgar has returned. He must have fled the castle after they arrested Kay. He swallowed hard. If he sees me, he could try to kill me, like Kay wanted to. I'm sure he was the one behind the challenge in the first place. No chance Kay had enough smarts or ambition to come up with it on its own. On his own. Guinevere gnawed on her lower lip. What do we do? she asked. Should we try to get out of here? She looked out the window. It was a long fall to the ground. Maybe she could try to find another shape-shifting spell, one that would work for both of them. More magic. It had become a true slippery slope. But Arthur shook his head, walking back over to the table in the spell book. We can't leave. Not without Merlin. This is our only chance to reach him. We need to try to cast the spell, whatever it is. It's the only way. Guinevere picked up the book and looked down at its golden words. Her heart was beating very fast. The last thing she wanted to do was try to cast a random spell without having any idea of what she was doing. Especially a spell to conjure up an evil wizard. But then, if Arthur was right and Sir Edgar meant to kill him, Merlin might be their only hope. All right, let's give it a try, she ventured. But no promises it's going to work. I believe in you, Arthur said simply, and she felt a tug in her heart again. Sorry, mother, but I have no choice. Drawing a breath, she looked down at the golden words on the page. Here went nothing. Iter per tempest, she began chanting. The golden letters started to glow in the page as she spoke them. Iter per tempest, tempest vietor, and suddenly... Everything went black.